What is up, everybody? We are live on YouTube. We're doing an AMA. Ask me anything. Um, I won't have the answers to everything, but I will have answers to stuff related to the things that I know, which is a very narrow thing called bodybuilding and strength sports. So yeah, um, pleasure to join you all and big thanks to some of the folks who have left some questions on the front end. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna start with those. Just like my last AMA, I'm gonna be, try to be efficient, gonna go for about an hour answering questions. And this of course will be available to watch on replay for those who subscribe to the Team 3DMJ channel, which if you're not already doing, what are you doing with your life? So definitely hit subscribe, hit like, uh, give us a high rating, help us out uh, so we can reach more people and hopefully help them. So starting off with Ariel, I'm on a calorie surplus aiming for muscle gain. If I'm doing 18 sets of chest and back and 12 sets of shoulders, how many sets should I do for triceps and biceps to, to avoid overreaching? I have read your book, The Muscle Pyramid, but I'm confused about the overlap uh, muscle group volume. So a couple things to remember is that the muscle and strength pyramid is explaining to you uh, what the general guidelines are that are associated with the best outcomes for hypertrophy and strength. Uh, they're not telling you that everyone should be doing this and they're explaining to you how to program. So um, 18 sets of chest and back and 12 sets of shoulders um, could be perfect, could be too little, could be too much. And there's no way to get around this without some experimentation. Um, specific to your question broadly to think about overlap, every time you do a pressing exercise, you're training uh, the triceps, except for the long head, which because it's biarticular is typically uh, active not on that movement and maybe more so on, on pulling and back movements. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, shoulders, same thing. Every time you're pressing, every time you're pulling, you're doing some, some bicep work. Uh, so the way that I have derived that 10 to 20 sets recommendation is based upon meta analyses that have looked at hypertrophy in response to number of sets per week. And there's a couple of these. So there was one published in 2017 by Schoenfeld and colleagues that looked at three different categorizations, one to four sets, five to nine sets, and 10 plus sets. And there was a more recent meta-analysis that looked at higher volumes and it looked at um, 12 or less, uh, 12 to 19, and then 20 plus. And it found similar findings, basically, that the uh, you don't need to go as high as, as, as 20 plus for most of the comparisons, uh, the, uh, the less than 12 and the 18, or, or and the 12 to 19 performed similarly. So, 10 to 20 is still a pretty good recommendation, uh, even though my books came out before that most recent meta-analysis uh, for a general place to start. But importantly, that's like the bell curve. Some people are respond better to higher or lower volumes. Another really important thing is that the way that those sets are counted in the research, they don't care if it's direct work. So when you take a study where the, the athletes or the participants are, are doing rows, they count that for back and biceps. So if they're measuring biceps hypertrophy and they're looking at that and they did 10 sets of back, that's counted as 10 sets of biceps. So that's the same way I counted in the book. So if basically what you want to do is probably just do a little bit of direct work for biceps and triceps, that might just be like three sets a week because you're already getting a fair amount from uh, your, your more from your compound movements that are designed to train chest and back uh, and shoulders, and then just see how it goes. Um, if you were, lingering doms in your biceps and triceps is kind of constant. Uh, and if they seem to be growing well, then that's probably either too much or sufficient. Uh, if they are never getting sore, if they're not growing well, but your back and your chest are, then maybe you need to do a little bit more. If you're getting like elbow tendonitis and you're constantly sore there, then it's probably too much. But um, most novices and intermediates need very little direct work for the biceps if they're doing a sufficient amount of pressing and pulling and the triceps. Uh, and it sort of takes care of itself, but you probably want to do some direct work, um, but it doesn't need to be much. It really could just be, you know, a couple exercises per week for three sets a piece. And that should take care of it, unless you're someone who just needs more direct work to, to grow those muscle groups. And you're just going to have to um, basically experiment. Um, so remember that my books are giving guidelines and explaining to you how to program. They're not telling you what works for everyone. Uh, and they're not telling you then they aren't predicting what's going to happen either. You have to actually get in the trenches and get dirty. They're just helping you with a good starting point and then giving you assistance on how you can tell on how to make adjustments when things do or don't work well. All right, MS, regarding hypertrophy training, why do legs uh, grow slowly compared to other muscle groups? And what can be done to promote growth size for legs? I have not noticed that. Uh, I don't have any personal experience in my 
18 years of, of training myself, coaching and doing research to think that legs grow more slowly compared to other muscle groups. Uh, this seems to be a pretty individual thing. Um, and with that said, when a muscle group is not growing well, the first thing you want to do is ensure that you are effectively training it, uh, that you are feeling it in the exercises you're trying to do, that your performance of, uh, of movements is, is good. A lot of the people I notice who don't get effective training on legs, they tend to train with a poor range of motion on some of the compound lifts. They do shallow squats, um, or shallow deadlifts, and then they train, um, you know, the typical hamstring curl and, and leg extensions. They're never really getting much training at long muscle lengths. So if you are starting to squat or leg press or hack squat deeper, uh, you'll, you'll typically notice that you get a lot more quote unquote bang for your buck. Uh, and sometimes these people, they keep that kind of poor form and then they dump a bunch of volume on top of it and it doesn't really fix the problem. Also, people tend to underestimate their proximity to failure um, more on lower body compound movements because it's harder, you know? So uh, on average, um, this is something anecdotally that I've experienced, not something that I can back up with research. Uh, I have seen that if someone is prone to underestimate their RP, so they think they are two reps from failure, but they're actually three, uh, on average, that might be more like two reps on average for the upper body and four reps on average for like the, the lower body. So it's possible that you're not training at long muscle lengths and you're training further from failure than you think. Um, that, but many things are possible. It's also possible that you just have stubborn legs, you know? Um, so the, the first step though, is to make sure that your performance of the exercises, both your technical ability, the range of motion, and then also your ability to gauge effort or proximity to failure is on, on point. Uh, and then give that a few months to see how that goes. And if that is not working, um, you can also just make sure that everything else is in order, uh, nutrition, sleep, recovery, um, and, uh, from that point on, if, if, if all that's in order and you're still not seeing your legs grow very well at that point, you might just need to do a little bit more, uh, work for your legs to make them grow. Unless of course you're finding that your legs are constantly sore, always beat up and you're, you're walking around sluggish and then you might actually need to be doing uh, less, but based upon what you said that you're on an upper lower four times a week with four to eight sets, uh, you know, per week for each muscle group, six to 10 uh, reps on compounds and 10 to 15 on secondary compounds and isolations. I would be surprised if it was uh, too much volume. You'd be a pretty high responder to each set if that was the case. So my guess would be uh, go through that checklist and then you might find that the best thing uh, would be to, to work on technical ability and effort before then thinking about potentially moving on to uh, a higher volume. Uh, lastly, you've noticed females grow the lower body quicker than the upper body and males grow the upper body quicker than the lower body. Uh, I, I noticed this in the general population. When I start working with powerlifters and bodybuilders, I don't notice this. So I personally think it has more to do with uh, what women and men on average uh, want to grow um, and, and the messages they get in society of, of what should be good. So uh, an attractive male is someone who has broad shoulders, big biceps, chest, all that stuff. An attractive woman is someone with you know muscular legs and glutes and things like that. So they tend to put more effort, time, and energy in. They actually don't necessarily care if the other muscle group grows very much. Um, when once that shifts and they're no longer trying to look good for the gram uh, or for their peers or what they think their peers want, which is not the gram and their peers really don't care, uh, and they're actually competing to get as big as possible. I have noticed this dis difference disappears. You know, once the standard is, hey, you're competing in physique sport every muscle group needs to be big. You tend to see that uh, an even level of effort applied and most people on average grow proportionally, but some people are different. And uh, I kind of refer back to my prior answer is that you need to then assess uh, the aspects, the holistic recovery and stress and stimulus aspects related to nutrition, sleep and all that stuff. And then finally, if that's the case, you might need to do more of a focus in terms of volume on the muscle groups that are lagging behind. All right. Ariel and MS, good questions. Thank you for kicking this off. Matthew Pritchard, finishing my master's in exercise science. Is a PhD route where you teach at a university the only route available for people with a PhD in a health science field? Well, I will say that health science uh, is a broader field than the specific PhDs that are out there. Um, you could do a PhD in uh, a very specific field. Like, for example, if you're in the U.S., uh, it requires a PhD to be a physical therapist. So you'd become a DPT, a doctor, in a, a doctorate in physical therapy, and typically a master's in exercise science will get you there. And then you're going to be a physical therapist. Um, 
if we're using health science to uh, in company or in, sorry encompass uh, nutrition, uh, then there are potential pathways where there's a PhD RD route. Those aren't as common because you don't need a PhD to be an RD, um, and you could be a registered dietitian. Um, and then additionally, getting a PhD uh, opens a lot of doors for working in academia. But the university that you work at can have a large influence on the type of work you do. Um, there are typically schools, at least in the U.S. and uh, North America, uh, that either classify or are, are classified as either more research schools or teaching schools. And if you go to a teaching school that doesn't have a lot of uh, you know, effort in trying to get research grant funding and, and publish a lot of research, and it's more so about educating the undergraduate students, you'll do a lot of teaching. Vice versa, if you go to like an R1 uh, research school, you'll teach a class or two, most likely, if you were to get a role as a professor. Uh, and most of the time will be spent running a lab, securing grant money, running research, uh, and securing postdocs, PhD students, and master's students who are doing theses and dissertations to collect research uh, and, and, pr and produce research. So two, two pretty different pathways. Um, if you get a PhD in, like, say, public health, um, you might be in a position where you could uh, be working in government. So trying to help establish initiatives or advise uh, legislators who are trying to influence public health. Um, and if you were to get a PhD in something like sports science, which is more common overseas, it's not that common in, in the States. Uh, ETSU, Eastern Tennessee State University, is, is an example of a sports science school. Uh, you might be embedded with a professional team or an NCAA team or at a, at a private studio or something like that. Uh, and you're providing analytics to uh, coaches, doing strength and conditioning and working with athletes. Um, so there's a broad number of things. And then also what, what is very common these days is just simply going the entrepreneurial route um, or some blended role. So like myself, I'm a research fellow at a university, Auckland University of Technology, and I primarily just do uh, supervision of master's and PhD students in my own research when I have the opportunity to do so. That's one tiny portion of, of what I do. And then I have uh, my entrepreneurial side of it where I'm a, uh, you know, a partner in mass, I have my books, I'm the scientific officer uh, and advisor to 3DMJ, and I do a little bit of coaching, uh, and I do speaking. So um, basically, I've, I've kind of carved my own niche. But I didn't just graduate my PhD and do that. I was already a full-time coach and had been a personal trainer for years. You know, I first started in the fitness industry training as a personal trainer in 05. We didn't start 3DMJ until 2010-ish. Didn't really get off the ground until 2011, uh, and that is when I stopped teaching in a personal training school. So there's a lot of various pathways. Um, so yeah, being a trainer, educating trainers, um, being a researcher, being a teacher, working in more specific sectors like physical therapy, um, a lot of options. Health coaching is now growing more and more and more. So uh, I think it's a good idea to think about where do you want to get to and then speak to some people who could act as mentors um, who are in those various fields and who can tell you a little more about uh, what's going on. So um, you may or may not, you're, you're, I'm glad you're doing your master's in exercise science. I would encourage you if there's a thesis option to do it, because you'll get a taste of what research is like. And most people either do or do not like research, very little in the middle, <laughs> um, or, or they, they appreciate it, but they don't like to conduct it. It's not kind of what they want to do, uh, or they really, really like it. So um, you know, also if, while you're doing your master's, if you have the opportunity to be a TA or do some teaching, uh, you can get kind of a taste of all these things. Um, I would suspect doing a master's in exercise science that maybe you've been a personal trainer, you are a personal trainer, you have some experience with that, um, or that's something that's on your radar. I would encourage you to get experience doing that. So if you get some experience teaching, coaching, doing research, um, then I think you'll be able to get an idea of where you want to go and what you want to do. Uh, and then it's just a matter of figuring out how you're going to carry that forward. Rizzo, what's up? Look at that. We got the team mental health specialist in here, making sure that no one harasses me and that I break down and just can't handle my shit. She's got my back. Thank you, Amanda. You're the best. Uh, we got Elon Musk in here too. That's great. So star studded cast. Personally, I think Amanda Rizzo far more important and, uh, and, and, and worthwhile to have on than Elon. No offense, but uh, hey, I'm just uh, just stating how I feel. All right, 
Let's see, we got more questions. Angel Loma, L Lomelli, Eric Helmsworth, when is the Pyramids 3.0 going to be released? I'll tell you this, I'm working on it. And that's about all I can say, because the one thing you never do as an author is you predict when that book is going to come out, because I ain't trying to be no uh, George R. R. Martin and make everyone hate me by being wrong. All right, Matt Cartwright, Eric, love your work. Thank you. Hope to come and meet you. And Omar at Sheffield this year, Matt from the UK. I will be there. I cannot wait. I'm getting really, really excited. Uh, SBD keeps announcing more of the wild card spots. Um, I got a Sitco, as I expected, would get the spot. So at the very least, I am also expecting Carlina to get a spot. Uh, Carlina Tongotia, who has the current 600 kilo world record um, to be there as well. I think she'll get a wild card spot. So it'll be a, a three way battle in the uh, in the 76s, which will be a lot of fun and very, very intimidating to me as a coach. Of course, I think it'll be intimidating for everybody. This is the first time the Sheffields have happened, the first time they've had a format for a competition where it's the percentage over the world record that you make. But I'm really uh, honored and privileged that I get to coach Jess, Jess Bittner there. And I'm working on spreadsheets now uh, on, on how we can I can make those comparisons and, and, uh, and look at it. Um, Elon, I am not currently stretching my calves as I speak. My plan is to work out after this. That's a little too close, and I don't want to go into my session where I'm doing calf raises, having to stretch for an hour. Um, on some days, I do do that. All right. Uh, the element asks, rest periods, question mark. Yes. Uh, Dave McConey. What's up, Dave? I hope you're ready for an entire podcast about everyone's favorite topic, my dude, calf training. Yes. And for those who follow the Iron Culture podcast, you'll know that I do not own uh, my feet. They're not my intellectual property, but my calves I've got. So I'm allowed to talk about that. I won't get sued. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to being on, Dave. Thanks for having me. All right, TM, do you know how many hours after you eat a mixed meal of protein and fat does thermic effect peak? I do not know. And most importantly, it probably doesn't matter unless you're trying to study that in a research design. It have no impact on the decisions you'd make from a nutrition or exercise perspective. All right, Rake. Hey, Dr. Eric, hope you're well. Are you still training full? Oh God, I scrolled down too far. Oh, oh no, where am I? I lost it. Folks, Amanda, help me. Okay, now I'm back, cool. Uh, are you still training full body four times per week? How has your programming evolved since starting that regime? Uh, I was training five times a week and I still am. And um, I have basically just refined it and figured out uh, exercise order, how many exercises I can do in a day, the balance between compound lifts, and then uh, just thinking about where I want to put things and where I want to structure my off days. So currently, my default setting is I train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I take Wednesday and Sunday off. And typically on uh, Tuesdays and Saturdays is where I put uh, harder kind of days. So for example, Tuesday, I do bench and squat. And then on uh, Saturdays, often when I'll do like RDLs. Uh, so I have that extra day of recovery. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. So it's it's going well. Um, and Nigo, what are your thoughts on training at fixed volumes each week during a mesocycle versus going from a minimum effective volume and ramping up to a maximum recoverable volume? I think either approach is totally fine. I think most people don't actually know what their minimum effective volume or maximum recoverable volume is. So ultimately, uh, you probably just want to look at your average volumes and gauge your progress and see how you're going. Um, there's certainly uh, no definitive reason why one would be better than the other. Uh, it's more about the dose over time. Um, and uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go up to your maximum recoverable volume because we don't see much evidence of overreaching uh, that I've seen that significantly improved outcomes in terms of uh, hypertrophy or strength. And it is far beyond the point of where you're getting the maximum benefit. So uh, there's another piece between minimum effective dose and maximum recoverable. That's, I think that's a useful theoretical model to be clear. And that's the maximum adaptive volume. So if you think about the amount of work you're doing, there is a point where you're getting the similar effect, even though you're increasing volume. So the maximum adaptive volume is the first point where it peaks. Maximum recoverable is past the last point when it peaks. And when you actually start to gain slower because you're, you're hindering your ability to recover. And it's basically the point all the way down here. If this is gaining muscle and this is losing muscle and this is maintaining muscle and this is volume, that's maximum that's maximum recoverable volume there's really no reason to be here you're doing so much that you can barely recover and you're not progressing and some ideas though then you'd super compensate but there's really no evidence to suggest you would um you can we do have evidence of super compensation for you know using a taper 
after a peak uh, to, to maximize strength. Um, but strength is more associated with like the load on the bar and exposure and peak loading rather than the total volume. The relationships with strength are actually pretty weak with volume. So I think generally, you want to be hanging around your minimum, which you, which you can't really know that well. It's very difficult to figure out where you are on these landmarks and they change. Uh, you want to be generally between like the minimum effective dose uh, and your maximum adaptive volume and modulating in there most of the time. And then occasionally deloading when you start to push yourself to the point uh, where you're not recovering effectively. And importantly, just because your performance may not be recovering, it doesn't mean other aspects might fall off earlier. You can get uh, pain, overuse injuries, uh, mental burnout um, before you're actually at the point where you're quote unquote overreaching or overtraining um, because it's strength is one of those things that uh, is the, one of the last characteristics that seems to fall off from doing too much, if you will. Um, so I'll leave it at that. If you want to learn more about that, I would recommend you check out uh, the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. And we had a pretty good discussion on overreaching and overtraining. And I think that would be a really good one for you to listen to. All right, Jason, updates on the calf boot. I have my last measurements wearing the calf boot tomorrow. So I'm got uh, a w wearing it today, and then tomorrow I'm getting my 12-week post measurements on my calf to see the level of growth, range of motion measurements, and isometric calf raise strength. And then I'm going to do a week where I'm basically doing a deload program. I'm taking my sets on calves now from 20 to 12, and I'm not stretching. And we're going to see if I what happens to my to my my muscle thickness and circumference on my calves. Does it decrease? Does it increase? Does it stay the same? Which might give us some indication of like. Uh, are there differences between the stimulus from stretching and resistance training? Can resistance training maintain stretching gains or no? Um, and of course, it's just a case study design. It'll be a little muddied of waters. Like we won't know if I actually need more than 12 sets to maintain. Uh, and it's more that the decrease from 12, 20 to 12, but I don't think that's likely the case um, for just decreasing your volume by 40% for a week shouldn't result in atrophy in a muscle group. So do you think the idea of from TM, 10,000 steps is a reasonable target? It's not an unreasonable target. Uh, when you look at uh, meta-analytic data on the relationship between steps and health, uh, you do see a dose-response relationship. Uh, however, when you start to look at the research on where is there an absence of a negative effect of being sedentary, it's below 10,000. So it's probably between six to 8,000 steps. That's when you stop seeing uh, negative impacts on the metabolic response to feeding. So they've done a bunch of studies where they either uh, ramp up sedentary time, they prevent people from being active. So they quantify it in the number of hours spent being sedentary a day, or they restrict step count. They say, hey, you got to keep your steps, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 steps per day for like two weeks. Then what we're going to do is we're going to give you a, uh, an exercise bout and a challenge meal. So we're, we'll have you jump on uh, the treadmill for an hour at a decent you know, heart rate, and we'll feed you a glucose and or triglyceride overload. And then we want to look at how long does it take you to be able to sequester those nutrients. Uh, and when you've been sedentary, that exercise bout is less effective at getting uh, blood glucose and triglycerides disposed back into tissues. So that's a, a negative effect on metabolic health in the acute term. But when you take people over like say six to 7,000 steps, that starts to go away. When you start to look at all cause mortality, you start to stop seeing a negative effect of being sedentary around that same mark. So uh, in a practical sense, you don't need to go to 10,000 steps. It might be healthier, but now you're getting like a positive benefit rather than removing a negative to go higher. But I think there is a, is a point where the, the returns are diminishing. Um, and I think it is probably, let's turn off my uh, phone there, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a point where it, I think there's better things to be doing with your time. Um, and most importantly, it's not very individualized. So if you're someone who's currently quite sedentary and you only get about 2000 steps per day on average, and you're told to get 10,000 steps, that's going to be really challenging, potentially make you feel like you failed when you're actually getting a benefit, even from going from 2000 to 5,000. So I think a good reasonable recommendation is to like increase your step count by something like 25% at most at any given time, and then adapt your lifestyle around that. And you're slowly working towards trying to get to maybe that average of six to 8,000 steps per day um, and then hanging out there. All right. Um, Ariel, thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Uh, TM, Campos et al. 2020 found high EMG in the side delt and pressing movements. 
You covered this before, but not sure if your stance has changed after Vygotsky's EMG paper. So still presses for side delt. Yeah, so um, Vygotsky has done some really good work in this area. And I would encourage everyone to listen to the Iron Culture podcast episode where we have Andrew Vygotsky on and we talk all about EMG. And if I was to briefly summarize the issues with EMG, is that the assumptions built into surface electromyography, which is basically putting electrodes on the skin uh, and measuring the electrical activity uh, to the degree that it can, uh, is that there are a lot of things that confound the electrical signal. So some muscles activate in a superficial to deep manner, some in a deep to superficial manner, and some not in that homogenous of a manner either way. So depending on the muscle being measured, it can give you readings that are confounded by the fact that you're measuring at the surface. Additionally, when you change acutely the uh, architecture or the morphology of a muscle just by changing its position. So like, for example, if I'm, if I'm pressing at two different angles, I'm gonna have a different position of my deltoid and pecs, right? Because they're more or less stretched and they're in a different position. I'm, I'm moving and that independently can affect the signal. So some of those things might confound some of these measurements. With that said, when you're measuring within person, Two similar exercises where the muscles are in a reasonable, reasonably similar position, you can make some limited inferences, but the inferences are such that are that, that you basically can only know whether the muscle is on or not. Um, we don't, and there's more things that affect it. So for example, you can have a muscle as a very strong EMG signal, um, but it's always in a shortened position for that exercise. And you'd expect it probably wouldn't hypertrophy very well because we know that being in a lengthened position while contracting sends a greater hypertrophy stimulus. So I, I do think just understanding biomechanically uh, that the side delts are assuredly active in overhead pressing movements, probably the more that you are actually in abduction and pressing here, kind of like quote unquote behind your head. Uh, and the less so, the more it's kind of like out here, incline press, and probably less so with your, uh, with your shoulders adducted a bit. So it depends on form. Um, but I do think if you just think about how would you actually get your shoulder into this position, uh, that the, the overhead presses are a good overall delt builder, not so much for the rear delts, but, um, definitely for the front and side delts. And, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think my stance has changed there. I don't have strong evidence to compare like a lateral raise to a, an overhead press, but I will say this, uh, that since, like if you were to compare dumbbell lateral raises to overhead press, I'd be pretty confident that the overhead press would be better because you're actually under load in the more stretched position throughout the whole range of motion. When the lateral raise, it's not until you get out to about, you know, 45 degrees away from your body that you're actually getting load from that dumbbell. If you were to compare a cable lateral raise to overhead press, not sure. Now you might have the advantage for, for, the, for the side delt. Um, but uh, I think we, generally to answer your question, uh, I am a lot less confident than I used to be in extrapolating from EMG findings because of its extensive limitations. I don't think it should be thrown out completely, but you have to fulfill a lot of tick boxes that limits its applicability to practical application for an EMG study to really have confidence. Uh, so yeah, I, I think ultimately we need more studies measuring hypertrophy over time, comparing different exercises for us to make those types of inferences. All right. Um, John K, hello, I'm on a calorie deficit. Macrofactor app has my TDE at 1750. How low of a calorie floor would you go? Uh, 51 years old, 5'11", 174 pounds, 13% body fat, 10 weeks cutting, already was at 2250 kcals. Uh, I think a general rule of thumb is that you probably don't wanna lose weight any faster than 1% of your body weight per week. Uh, so whatever level of calorie deficit gets you there, general recommendation is roughly like a 15 to 25% energy deficit. Um, so if you're, the app has you at a TDE of, of about 1750, I probably wouldn't go much lower than, I, I mean, that's on the lower end. So I would probably focus maybe on increasing your expenditure if it's not already reasonably low, maybe take some time off, come back to, to it. You can always do a diet break. And uh, yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to sustainability, uh, which comes down to, do you have a well-balanced diet? Uh, how do you feel? Are you white knuckling it right now if you're really struggling? Uh, and then are you able to have a real reasonably balanced diet from like a fruits, vegetables, micronutrients perspective? Because uh, it gets challenging once you get pretty low in calories to, to get the protein in you need, to get the fruits and vegetables in you need, and to get, you know, a decent spread of essential fatty acids. So, you know, in your case, personally, I probably wouldn't have you under 1600 calories. 
Um, and I would keep a close eye on how sustainable the process felt. And if I really started struggling or if you're like, man, I'm white knuckling it, I'm hungry all the time, I feel lethargic, I'd be like, hey, let's take a month eating at, uh, at maintenance and see how high I can get my calories with minimal weight gain and then come back to it as kind of a mental refresh. Okay. All right. Jay, on a gaining phase, I find it difficult ingesting sufficient carbs unless I resort to eating more simple carbs, e.g. orange juice, pasta, rice, krispies, etc. Eat them then. Fantastic. Just make sure you're getting a, you know, a baseline level of fiber, fruits, and vegetables, and there's nothing wrong with that. Great books, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, John Rich, have you ever tried Dorian Yates Hit? No, but I have tried similar low-volume, high-intensity programs. Uh, for, for the OGs, you might remember Max OT. Uh, which I think was popularized by Skip LaCour and oh God, another another popular 90s natural bodybuilder. I'm forgetting his name. But anyway, essentially you're doing between four to eight sets, um, typically to concentric failure, primarily compound movements, and you're training each muscle group no more than once a week, sometimes every five days. Um, and you're doing... So, so it's reasonably low volume. And that was good for me until it stopped being good for me. I made some great strength gains. Uh, my legs grew because they grow from everything. And I got up to, I think, a three-plate bench after having not been a three-plate bench for a while. Uh, and then I really couldn't get past that. So it was, it was decent. It was a really good intermediate program. And I think what it taught me is, A, uh, how to gauge accurately proximity to failure or it reinforced that because I was training to failure before that with different types of programs. Uh, it emphasized uh, the kind of mentality that I needed to go in with a low volume, high intensity program. Also the reps are almost never over 10 in, in uh, max OT. It's typically like four to 10 reps. Um, and uh, it made me get the most out of each one of my sets because you have less to, to play with. So you're a little more focused on each one of those sets and you're able to bring a level of uh, concentration and purpose and intent to the exercise, which I think you can then carry that over to a program that might be better for you if you need it. Um, but I think there's nothing wrong with trying a lower volume, high intensity approach because there's, it's, it's clear if it doesn't work what you do, right? Like if, if, if you start to plateau on that, you'll probably need to do more and you probably can't do more at that intensity. So you find the middle ground and you move up a little bit. But sometimes you find that is that's all that's needed to make gains for a long time. So uh, yeah, that's my general thoughts there. All right, how much can we account for hamstring to quad overlap in exercises like squats and deadlifts? Um, so you're actually not really using your hamstrings much at all during squats. So the hamstrings are a biarticular muscle. That means that they cross both the hip and the knee, except for the short head of the biceps femoris, which it's at the bottom and only crosses the knee. So it only performs uh, knee flexion, but the hamstrings act as hip flexors, sorry, hip extensors, as well as knee flexors. And when you're doing a squat, you're trying to do knee extension. So I will, I will, I will demonstrate what the hell I'm talking about for people who are not super familiar with anatomy. All right. So, chair. so when I'm squatting, I'm both extending my hip and extending my knee, right? When you combine this with this, you get a squat, right? So if the hamstrings can both flex my knee and also extend my hip and the quads are extending my knee, they're not going to be active because the knee flexion, it doesn't get to choose. It does both. It extends the hip and it flexes the knee. So it's going to be inactive so that my quads, which are doing the majority of the work in a squat can extend the knee. So when you look at studies on EMG and more importantly, as we learned, when you look at studies on hypertrophy, you typically see no, no significant growth in the hamstrings in response to squats because the hamstrings are relatively quiescent. I mean, they're not active, right? They're just there as a stabilizer. So it is the glutes and the quads that do the vast majority of work on, on a squat, in addition to like your lumbar and all the other muscle groups that are they're involved because it's a full body movement. Deadlifts are a little different. There's very little knee extension in deadlifts unless you've got some pretty outlier um, anthropometrics or limb lengths. So I, I think a good way to think of squats is that they are a quad and glute builder and that deadlifts are a glute and hand builder because they're predominantly uh, hip extension while the other one's predominantly knee extension and hip extension. So what you're missing is actually direct hamstring work, um, which is necessary only for, which I planted that seed earlier, the 
uh, short head of the bicep femoris, the lower kind of quote unquote hamstring. Uh, if your goal is, is hypertrophy, of course, you may not give a shit because it's not really active on either one. Uh, and when you're, when you're doing squats and deadlifts, like if you're a power lifter, leg curls probably don't need to do them. Um, and then uh, the rectus femoris, which is one of the heads of the quadricep, like the hamstrings is a biarticular muscle. So it is also one, it crosses the hip and the knee. So it's a hip flexor and a knee extensor. So because during squats, you're doing hip extension, it is inactive because it performs hip flexion. So when you look at uh, hypertrophy in response to studies where they use squats, you typically see the rectus femoris. This is a sideways body. Here's the glutes, here's the, the quad, and here's the hamstrings. You see the hamstrings and the rectus femoris don't grow very much. All the other heads uh, of, of, the, uh, of the quads, the vast thigh muscle group, and the glutes, they grow quite well. That's what squats are great for. Um, but if you want to get the rectus femoris to grow, you need to do isolated knee extension. And if you want to get the hamstrings group to grow, especially that lower portion. If you want to grow the, the, uh, the short head of the biceps femoris, which is only a knee flexor, you've got to do knee flexion. So that's one of the reasons why when you see me write a program for a bodybuilder, it almost always includes some exercises that isolate the, the uh, knee extension and knee flexion actions because they're just not hit by squats and deadlifts. And the overlap that you need to worry about for squats and deadlifts is typically the lumbar and sometimes the glutes, although the glutes are a pretty robust muscle. Um, and it depends on what position you get into. Uh, some sumo pullers do notice they get some pretty significant stimulus from uh, the, the quads if they're getting deep, but typically they're being trained at a shorter muscle length compared to squats, where if you get down deep, you're getting a pretty good stretch in the quads. Um, so I think the overlap there is more to be considered for the lumbar and the glutes from a hypertrophy perspective. Uh, and just that they, they're both very hard and tiring and they load your spine, so they probably uh, need to be separated in the week to some degree. All right. James, is there any merit behind training heavy to increase activation of or increase size of fast twitch fibers, even if you're a slow twitch dominant athlete? First off, um, it's hard to know if you're actually a slow twitch dominant athlete. Um, you'll hear SNC coaches, old school ones, especially like, oh, that's a fast twitch athlete. Um, but what they could be seeing is just someone who has good coordination, uh, who has a good tendon stiffness, they're quite bouncy, uh, or someone who has, you know, other morphological and muscle architecture characteristics that make them, you know, faster or slower. Um, typically high level endurance athletes are slow, slow twitch dominant. That's kind of a selection criteria. Uh, and there is some adaptation probably that, that comes from all that training. Um, but I will say that uh, if you do a lot of weightlifting, you're typically seeing uh, like slower, fast twitch adaptation. So everything you have with type two X fibers as they use in the old nomenclature, which are the fastest fiber. But once you move from being sedentary to active, everything is more glycolytic and more endurance than, than sitting on the couch doing nothing. So those two X fibers move towards becoming a little more oxidative, like type two A. Um, so most people who lift weights uh, are, are kind of moving towards that kind of moderate isoform, right? Um, might be a little different for certain styles of training, uh, very heavy uh, singles only type of Bulgarian-esque approach, or maybe uh, athletes who do a lot of jumping and power-based stuff. But if you're bodybuilding, powerlifting, uh, you're going to see a fair amount of uh, that, that type 2 AI form and then kind of things moving towards that. That's kind of the catch-all lifting weights, you know, best energy system uh, style of, of, of fiber, if you will. However, it really doesn't matter. Um, most fibers produce a similar force when, uh, when standardized to area. Uh, so your slow twitch fibers and your fast twitch fibers, when you think about Henneman's size principle, which just says that, you know, fibers are recruited in order of, of, of size, basically. So your larger, uh, innervated type two fibers, which are the fastest twitch, um, and your slowest fibers are all recruited when you lift heavy enough, when you start touching something around you know, probably 50 or 60% of 1RM for the prime mover, and then maybe closer to 70 to 80% of 1RM uh, for other muscle groups. And it depends on exercise. There's a lot to it. We don't actually know where that, that point is, but a decent rule of thumb when you look at EMG is like for the prime movers around, you know, it's relatively low uh, percentage of 1RM when you start to activate a fair amount. And if you go to failure, pretty much everything or close to failure, even pretty much everything gets activated. Um, so that's some background information. To build upon your question, um, 
lifting heavy doesn't preferentially train slow, uh, head, you know, fast twitch fibers, and neither does lifting light preferentially train slow twitch fibers. The collective data we have right now suggests that heavy or light training results in similar, especially if you're going to the same proximity to failure, outcomes for all muscle groups. And when you think about training for specificity, like if we took the logic that, oh, a slow twitch dominant athlete needs to train for their slow twitch fibers, then you would think endurance training would make marathon runners jacked. It doesn't, right? Uh, if you want to get big, you need to lift for hypertrophy, period, right? That, that's the best approach for everyone. Someone who's built to be an endurance athlete will be just less successful, but they should still use that similar style of training. So the concept of training to your uh, fiber uh, distribution or propensity as an athlete is one that I think is probably misguided. Uh, and, and it's not, there's no evidence to back it up that it is a uh, useful approach of training. Okay, we got another question. Rest periods, question marks. Yes, I agree. Rest periods, questions. Um, yeah, so I'll give the same level of effort that you asked in that question in my answer. Yes, rest periods. Okay, James C., how would you program for someone who is looking to just get stronger and put on size, but not looking to compete at all? Is the squat bench dead necessary? Absolutely not. The only reason that uh, we associate the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift with uh, strength programs is because powerlifters are the most obvious and inaccessible uh, style of strength. Most people can't do a snatch or a clean. Um, and when you see cleans being done by high school football players, those aren't cleans. Um, so what do you want to get strong on? Use those exercises. I think a decent kind of holistic functional approach to strength is to have some horizontal pressing, some vertical pressing, some horizontal pulling, some vertical pulling, some type of hinge and some types of, of squat. If you're looking just to, to train all the muscles in the body reasonably well, that'll cover 90% of your basis. And if you're looking to have some strength that applies to activities of daily life, that covers you know most of them. Uh, you can make an argument of having like a gait pattern style uh, lift as well. So like single leg work, um, if you really want to get out there on, on, on the kind of the functional tilt um, potentially moving in different planes, but you know, eventually it gets to the point where you've got to do weighted everything. But I think from just a general perspective, yeah, you choose the, the horizontal and vertical and uh, upper body movements for push and pull that you like, choose a hinge that doesn't hurt, choose a squat ish pattern. that doesn't, it could be leg press. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just train them in moderately low to low reps and uh, progressively and do a fair amount of volume and you will get bigger and stronger simultaneously. And there you go. Jay, how should I decide when to do a deload week? For example, if my progress stalls for more than one week, um, generally a deload is in place because the fatigue that is accumulating from day to day actually carries over into subsequent weeks. Uh, you might be stalling your progress, um, not because you were under recovered, but just because the stimulus is insufficient or because your expectations that you're able to progress on a week to week basis are unrealistic. If everyone could progress on a week to week basis and add five pounds to every lift, we would have some pretty strong people after two years of lifting. That would mean that every lift you did, if you did it on a weekly basis, would increase by 260 pounds per year. And at year two, your baseline strength plus 520 pounds would be all of your lifts. So if you started with a 135 bench press for, let's say, a set of five, and each week you went up five pounds for two years, you'd be doing a 695 uh, bench for five reps. And if that is the case, John Hack, thanks for joining us. Um, actually, that's even stronger than John Hack. That's, that's, that's a redonkulous bench press. So I think you see what I'm saying, that the, uh, the assumption of your ability to progress is not just dependent upon deloading. So some of the, the, the metrics I use to assess when one needs to deload are not only are you plateaued and you're, you're seeing that for a reasonable amount of time for your training age, you can't progress, but also that you are seeing a lower motivation to train, you're sore than normal, aches and pains are worse than normal, your sleep might be disturbed, um, and you're finding uh, that you feel a little more sluggish and that your performance is really inconsistent. Sometimes it's not just plateaued, but actually down. Um, and uh, generally your, your stress levels, you, you self-perceive them as being higher. When all those things or, or a few of those things at the same time are happening and you're also pushing pretty hard and trying to progress and you're you know, training hard, uh, for subjectively for what that's worth. Uh, now that might indicate that you need a deload. Um, but if things feel pretty easy and you're just plateaued, then you probably are either one, need, need to increase your training stress, not necessarily volume, 
but you need to make your training more effective and more stimulative. Um, or you need to adjust something else that creates the environment for that stimulus to be effective. Could be nutrition, could be sleep. Um, or you, everything is right, but you need to wait two weeks to progress, you know? So uh, that is a process of uh, experimentation and discovery that you need to go on to really figure that out. Okay. Muhammad, how can... Uh, All right, I'm going to try to, how can we program load based on RPE, uh, like seven this week and second RPE eight with solid reps or reps approach, like increase one rep every time, double progression, or do both like six to eight reps, eight RPE and progress from here. I come from your book right away. Um, Muhammad, I'll be honest with you. I don't actually understand your question. I'm sorry. Might be the language barrier. And that's on me that I'm, I'm you know, I'm not able to interpret that. Um, but there are multiple progression approaches in the book. Um, and the general idea is that if the RPE stays the same from week to week to week, um, hopefully your loads are able to slowly creep up. And uh, that, that's a potential option. Um, or you can have a, 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 like the intermediate approach where the reps descend each week while the RPE stays the same, meaning you'd expect the load to go up. So you might do three sets of eight at an eight RPE with hundred pounds next week, three sets of seven at eight RPE with 110, et cetera, et cetera. So the load is going up as the reps go down to allow you to stay in an appropriate RPE while load goes up. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if not, then if you can think of a way to write that more clearly, I might be able to answer it. If not, my apologies, just make sure that you have read through the entire progression chapter and also how to program that appendix. All right, Rick, any downsides at all to getting volume two sets times five days versus five sets times two days? Probably not. Um, ultimately, uh, so long as those proximities to failure are quite similar, volume over the course of the week is probably going to be uh, pretty similar. Uh, and it's more about that dose under the curve. Um, I'm assuming your goals are um, hypertrophy and strength or one or the other. Uh, strength is going to be more related to the peak load that you're hitting. So if you do five days and two sets and each one of those top sets is a higher load than it would be if you did five sets on two days because the load probably would descend, that could be better for strength because the peak load uh, would be higher. The average peak load would be higher with the higher frequency. Um, but if you're kind of thinking about this from a hypertrophy perspective, probably no difference. Okay, thoughts on the Jefferson curl and is there any studies around this subject of loading? Flexion. I know Stuart McGill is not a fan and stated there are risks and rewards for certain sports. Uh, no, I'm not aware of any studies and I don't really have strong thoughts on it, to be honest. Um, all right, John Kay, I'm 51, just started lifting about a year ago. No stranger to general fitness. How realistic can someone my age build muscle or am I just trying to prevent loss? The test is 7, 7, 773. That's a really high test. Yeah, actually, there are a ton of studies on people who are uh, a decade or more old than you, John, and, and they build muscle when uh, on average, when, when lifting. So um, you're starting a little later uh, th than some to the party, but it is 100% possible to not only build muscle, but strength. And it's not just trying to prevent losses. So I would suspect that you could probably put on a good chunk of muscle that will be great for the rest of your life. And you'll be creating a surplus before you actually get to the point um, where you're starting to see a challenge. Uh, when we look at actually large scale data, and you control for activity levels. So you're someone who's quite active. Um, so this would apply to you. It's not until people are after 60 where sarcopenia starts to be observable at the population level. It may for some individuals. I would also point out that there are a number of very high level strength athletes and natural bodybuilders who are highly competitive. Um, granted, they didn't start lifting at 51, um, but they're able to keep progressing into their 50s. So for example, Jeff Alberts is 51. Uh, Brad Loomis is 51. Um, if you really want to see some craziness, uh, Superman, Dave Ricks, you should look up his open powerlifting. I want to say at 55 or 56, he might have peaked with his powerlifting total um, as someone who's been lifting for years and years and years. And he's still ridiculously competitive in the open. And now he's in his 60s. Um, so there's a lot of people out there who are good examples. And I'm not saying they're the norm. They might be somewhat of an outlier. Uh, but the fact that you've got 773 tests at the age of 51, you've been working out your whole life, uh, I would suspect that, uh, not that I think testosterone actually plays a major role here, because um, women clearly build muscle and they've got a lot lower tests than us, right? Uh, I think you've probably got at least 10 years of good muscle building in you. 
especially if you're dedicated, consistent, and you're focused on uh, on all, all the big rocks and you get them in place. And then you've done yourself a huge favor as you go into uh, your 60s, 70s and beyond where it does get harder to maintain muscle mass, bone mass, fall prevention becomes important, all this stuff. You're also building coordination um, and you're exposing yourself to new motor patterns, which I think is going to have substantial impact on uh, quality of life and mobility as you age. So uh, kudos to you. And I think that's a great example uh, to, to everyone around you. And hopefully it inspires a lot of your other friends to train as well, because it is never too late. Truly, you are only going to get a benefit from starting to lift weights at any point in life. All right. Hamza Physique, if you were to start from scratch again, what would your uh, what would your best approach be in terms of getting to your natural muscular potential as quickly as possible? Nutrition periodization wise. Honestly, I don't think I really made any mistakes there. I probably just gained more body fat than I needed to. Um, I got up to, let's say I started lifting weights and I was about 170 pounds. Um, if I was to put that in kilos for you, that's uh, like 77. And I very quickly got up to 100 within two years or 220 pounds for the, uh, the, the non uh, metric system listeners. And from about like when I got up to like 195 and I was at a reasonable pace, I think my body fat percentage was quite similar. So that means I was still gaining fat, but the percentage of my mass that was muscle looked visually quite similar. So I put on a, a solid chunk of muscle and then I was like, well, anything under 200 pounds is small because I read muscle magazines and it's the mid 2000s. Uh, so let me just force feed myself in bulk all the way up to 220. And I think the first 20, 25 pounds I put on compared to the last 25 pounds was a much larger proportion of muscle versus that last bit. It was probably like, you know, 80, 20 versus like 20, 80. <laughs> so I think I probably would have just uh, let that growth be slower and maybe pushed only up to like 205 or 210 over that same time period versus 220. Um, that's the only thing I would have changed because I, I think I think I maxed out how much I could grow because um, I was training progressively. I was eating in a surplus. I mean, maybe not on the training side, but on the nutrition side, I think I was doing everything I could. I created an environment where my protein was high enough. I was in a calorie surplus. Um, and, you know, maybe I mean, as in my early 20s, I was occasionally going out to drink on weekends and drinking too much. That's maybe one thing that I also could have done less, um, be a little less of a 22 year old. Um, but uh, yeah. So, uh, but I don't think it had a, a major impact when it did grow muscle pretty efficiently early on. Okay. Time under tension. In your book, you say just lift weight with control eccentric. Some folks when programming training, like they say, four second eccentric, does it matter? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Um, so long as you are under control, um, volume and intensity are proxies for time under tension. Because the if you spend more time slowing down your lifts, you won't get as many reps. So it ends up being six of one, half dozen of the other, which is just a saying to me that all comes out in the end quite similarly. Um, when you deliberately slow down lifting velocity, more so on the concentric than the eccentric, um, it means you're putting out less force. So if you think about it at the area of the curve, that's why I kind of have that, that area of the curve and I discussed impulse in my book to think about it. Like if you start slowing things down, then the peak force that you're putting out is lower which means the area under the curve of force, which is impulse, is similar or less. So um, you do want to make sure that it's not gravity lowering the weight for you. You want to make sure that there is tension occurring during the eccentric, and you want to make sure you're pushing forcefully on the concentric. And I think anything more than like a two to three, maybe four second eccentric is, is, is potentially going to harm your concentric performance. Um, so yeah. Okay. Anonymer glass of a halter. Dear Eric, comma. I think someone hit enter too early, but thank you for saying dear. All right, David Ruth, if you had to choose between Zurchers or uh, dumbbell single leg movements, bad right shoulder, uh, no safety bar squatter machine. Good question. All right. Um, I don't think you have to choose between them. They might they might be good because like if you think about sing, dumbbell single leg movements, you've got a nice like gait pattern. If you have any imbalances, you can work on one. And also you don't have to have this heavy load in your arms. You can just strap up and hold dumbbells. So I think it would probably be good to, you know, on one of your leg days or one, one of your training days, do zurchers. Think of that as like your heavy squat day. And then on another day, you could do something uh, like uh, elevated split squats or dumbbell lunges. And those would actually be good complementary movements for the lower body. So I, I don't think you need to have an, an either or. Um, both are good choices. And there are going to be some days where you're just like, I do not want to hold 
you know, this heavy weight in, my, in the crook of my armpit right now. I might try to just strap up, go lighter and get more reps and get a little more of a metabolic stress. All right, Jay, I used to use the Braun training principles. Oh, good, Stuart McRobert back in the day. I, I read Braun, uh, whereby there is a six to 10 week softening up period and bulking back to your PBs and beyond. Does this work for hypertrophy? It certainly works. I don't think there's anything wrong with that approach. I, God, I can barely remember the Stuart McRobert stuff. I, um, God, it's been over a decade since I've read it, probably 15 years, to be honest. I want to say it's a relatively low volume approach with like micro loading. And I think the only issue with that is if volume never increases, a lot of people will get to the point where their progress is a lot slower than it needs to be. And they have to micro load to make these small incremental gains in progress because they're doing something that is far lower than the stimulus they could be getting if they decided just to increase volume a little bit. So typically when you fall into the camp of either I'm primarily making volume adjustments or I'm primarily making intensity adjustments or load adjustments, you're basically unnecessarily removing options from the table. Uh, if your metric for progress, which I think it is a, a good one to have in the gold standard that we can have outside of a laboratory, is am I making progress in the gym on my lifts? Is my 5RM, my 10RM, my 3RM, my 12RM, is that going up? Um, if that is your goal, sometimes you will benefit from doing more total work. Uh, and other times you will benefit from, you know, instead of just focusing on doing more total work, just increasing uh, your, your exposure to heavier loads, like doing top singles or something like that. Both are viable options for increasing strength. If your goal is hypertrophy, though, um, it's not just the fact that your loads are going up. Uh, you want to be seeing them going up consistently over time and not just at the slowest rate that, that is possible for you at a given volume. If you're feeling like you're recovering absolutely fine and you're pushing really close to failure and you can only add like two and a half pounds, you know, to, to the bar every four weeks, it's worth trying. Let me try adding an extra set and see if I can speed up my rate of progress. There's, there's very little downside. And if it doesn't work, you just stop. Like you, you go back to the volume you were at. So that's, if I recall correctly, and I may be misrepresenting uh, the, the, the Braun book. So apologies if I am, that is my only critique of the approach there. And I think everything else, although it has been 15 years since I've read them is probably um, fine. You know, all right. We've got another, uh, Seven minutes, so I need to make sure I'm not getting too too behind on all these questions. There's a lot of good ones. Uh, Sage and Kim, hey doc, thoughts on body imbalances when it comes to training? Like, will imbalanced body parts interfere potential hypertrophy outcome? Uh, no, unless you have actual nerve damage or some prior injury uh, that is resulting in an imbalance, 99.5% of the time, which is a number I made up, but I'm confident that's around there. Uh, you are the only one who's aware of left to right asymmetries, like your left arm or your right arm. Um, and a lot of the times it's just down to just natural asymmetry that we all have. Um, I've never, literally never had a judge comment or notice left to right asymmetries on someone who does not have an injury, like a bicep tear or a shoulder injury or a drop shoulder or something like that, or nerve damage where one muscle group has obviously atrophied compared to the other, despite the fact that most bodybuilders and having been a judge myself and competed, and this being true of my physique, might have a half an inch or a full inch difference between their circumferences left to right. It's just not something that anyone except your own OCD mind is noticing in most cases. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, do you feel training with repetitions in reserve can leave people sandbagging workouts? Um, you can always train closer to failure and that will feel harder, but doesn't mean it's better. That's the question. So the, the, the question is, what is sandbagging me? If you could make a workout feel harder, is it better? You can go into every workout and do sets of 20 to 30 on compound lower body lifts and go to failure and it will feel harder. It won't necessarily be better than doing sets of eight to an eight RP though. So then the question becomes, okay, well, which one of those is better? Well, in that specific workout, maybe going to failure is, but what if you actually plan on training again sometime in the future or in the next two or three days, if you do multiple sets of, of, of 20 to failure on lower compound lifts, I can tell you what you won't be doing in the next couple of days, and that's legs. But if you are trying to achieve a certain target volume per week and you control proximity to failure, especially with long muscle length compound lift training with heavy loads that are technically complex, and then maybe you just go to failure on things like leg extensions or leg curls, and you think about this intelligently rather than just kind of black and white, failure or not failure, which I don't think is a good way to think about it. Now, all of a sudden, you can start optimizing your outcomes. So um, a lot of people struggle to tell the difference between discomfort and proximity to failure. 
So for example, one thing that we've consistently observed in the RIR research is that when, when doing higher reps, especially with compound lower body movements, people seem to underestimate their proximity to failure more often, but less so when they're doing things uh, like, you know, upper body movements or, or in, in lower rep ranges. So I think that, that that's really telling. And the most recent, and, and what, what does it tell? I'll, I'll connect that dot for you. It's really telling because that means that it can feel really hard, but you're not even actually going to failure. Um, and that means it's probably smarter to choose rep ranges where the discomfort isn't quite as high, so you can accurately gauge proximity to failure. Also, most recent meta-analysis that I was a part of, led by uh, Martin Reflo, he's a PhD candidate at, in, in Melbourne, and he's doing a great job uh, at Deakin University uh, with Jackson Fife and Lee Hamilton as his other advisors. Uh, he's doing his PhD specifically on proximity to failure in highly trained individuals. And he's done the most recent study published on this with the most well-trained population. We're talking uh, two groups of 12 men and women with, you know, years of resistance training experience, many of them competing in physique and strength sport and going to failure on bench press and looking at outcomes. And also did a meta-analysis, which I think is relevant, where they categorize things by actual momentary muscular failures. So the point when you can no longer lift and you're actually reaching concentric failure versus voluntary failure, studies where the researchers said, hey, when you think you've hit failure, you can stop, or they used a rep max, but didn't necessarily require them to actually hit that point of failure and compared it to non-failure training. And in the studies where it was momentary failure, there was not a clear difference between groups, but the voluntary failure groups, uh, there was almost a significant difference favoring volitional failure. So what that tells you is that getting closer and closer to failure is not necessarily better. And volitional failure, which is probably represented by like a zero to three RIR, depending on the study, given we know that people under predict, was better than momentary failure. And uh, when we look at the studies on failure in general, there's not a significant difference between training to failure or not. So basically what we see is that so long as you're reasonably close to failure, you're getting a pretty good per set stimulus. But we also know that fatigue lingers from one day to another when you're training to failure with a reasonably high volume. And most of the studies on failure training, people are training two or three days per week. Most of you who are tuned in here and all of the bodybuilders who've been surveyed in recent studies train four to six days per week. So twice as much has been observed. So sure, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with training to failure if you're only training two to three days per week because you got most of the week sitting around recovering and you're training with a low volume, low frequency program. But for bodybuilders and people who are trying to maximize and improve their physique, they're probably training with a higher volume because they know that's better. And that means they have to think intelligently about what came before and yesterday and how to program within a week. So that's my, my very long answer to that relatively short question. All right, last question. All right. Uh, what do you think about what I do in my career in bodybuilding? Train three months and break for another three months and repeat the cycle with no reasonable time, like six or one year of intelligent training. Um, I think you know what my answer to that is. I'm going to choose a different question. I don't think you should spend half of your time not training uh, if your goal is to make consistent progress. Um, so <clears throat> let me find a better question. Not that that's a bad question, but I think a question you already know the answer to. Um, okay. Hi, Eric. Could you elaborate on potential pros and cons of programming with a non-split paradigm? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I.e. not having assigned days for a specific muscle group as opposed to a split paradigm. So what we're talking about here is kind of the way I train or on any given day, you can do any exercise you want. Um, you can do without limits, instead of having say a push pull legs or an upper lower or a chest and back or a chest, shoulders, arms, legs, et cetera. Um, not to sound arrogant or elitist, but you have to actually know what you're doing. If you are training using an approach where you're not organizing things by body parts or upper lower or kind of those splits, I think those are really useful ways to not have to think very much about uh, overlap, right? So the stuff I explained earlier about the overlap between squats and deadlifts, most people um, aren't aware of that. And there's no reason they should be unless they're studying anatomy, right? And for them, it is probably better to design a workout where you have squats and deadlifts on two different days. And that's just a sign of a deadlift day and a squat day. It's kind of like the bodybuilding equivalent of a split. 
Um, but, you know, you, if you know what you're doing in powerlifting, you're going, well, I'm actually going to compete and do squat bench and deadlift in the same day. So when I'm closer to competition, I'm going to have a squat bench deadlift day. But I don't necessarily need in my training to have those be max outs. So maybe I will have more of a heavy technique day on deadlift and I'll do some volume on squats and then I'll do a heavy single on bench. But next week I can flip that around. So like you see what I'm saying is you have to know what you're doing to program with the overlap between the power lifts in relation to a competition and in relation to when you're when you're progressing. So you have to have the skill of a powerlifting coach. Likewise, for someone who is programming for bodybuilding and trying to optimize physique development, to organize your training without any specific limitation of what you could do on any given day, you have to understand which exercises based upon proximity to, excuse me, proximity to failure, the rep range, the total amount of volume, and the uh, muscle length of the training out that might cause muscle damage and poor performance in the subsequent days. And then what exercises would I not want to do on those days? Um, with experience, you can just figure this out. You don't need to actually study anatomy if I was to kind of correct myself. Um, Try doing RDLs to failure for five sets and then the next day, you know, do leg curls and squats and just see how it goes. Probably won't go well. So you'd go, oh, I'm not going to do that. You know, so through, through trial and error, I think you can get to the same place and you can figure out what placements are. So the way I would suggest someone trying this out to answer your question in Marat is basically Think of the list of exercises that you like to do that cover all your bases anatomically that will res result in hypertrophy. Think about the target volume as you're trying to achieve within a given microcycle. So the number of sets per muscle group you're trying to get to. And then go, okay, I'm going to do X number of sets of all these different exercises. And then start to plug and play and think where you put them. And you go, okay, well, you know, this back movement trains me at a, uh, let's say it's an unsupported it's, it's a non-chest supported row. It's a bent over barbell row. And I know my lumbar is a little uh, tired after that. So I'm probably not going to do deadlifts on the next day, right? But I could do, let's say, a seal row or a cable row on that day. Okay, that's cool. So I'll do a, a barbell row on Tuesday. The next day is a day off where I, where I don't do any squats or deadlifts. But then later in the week, I do have some back work that I want to do before deadlifts or squats. I'll do that chest supported row or a lap pull down or a pullover, right? So that's the type of process you'll go through. Um, you'll catch... A fair amount of those things on the front end, um, but not all of it. And then when you go actually go and train, you can make adjustments. So you have like a, a trial mesocycle where you have a couple of weeks and each week you go, oh, I'm going to swap these two things. I'm going to change that exercise out. Um, oh man, I did those incline curls and they really made my biceps sore. Uh, and the next day my lat pull down suffered, right? So I'm going to change that exercise or move them to different points or put them on the same day so that, uh, you know, delayed onset doesn't get in the way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of the process you go through it. So I would say the, the pro is that you get far more flexibility and you can find something that is more customized to you, which is the only reason why I train this way. I don't think it's better for everybody. Um, it can be better if you go through the process and figure out what it looks like, but sometimes it looks like something that is a pushable legs or an upper lower or something like that. Um, but you just have that, that flexibility to do that. Um, the con is that you have to do that, right? So, uh, an upper lower, upper lower is, is kind of foolproof. You know, it's, you're, you're, you're not going to have a, an upper day coming after, like there's some things you can, like some errors you can make like a barbell row. And then the next day is heavy, heavy deadlifts and squats. Like I wouldn't advise that. Um, but they are of less consequence and, um, it, it kind of sort of takes care of itself. So when you're training, you know, with one of these splits where, it's organized by body part overlap just kind of automatically gets most incidents of overlap automatically get taken care of. So hopefully everyone that that was helpful. Uh, big thanks to Elon Musk for taking some time off Twitter and not making electric cars to join us. Big thank you to Amanda Rizzo for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's questions. I know there's a ton that I wasn't able to get to, um, but this won't be my last one. So uh, much appreciative to everyone. Hopefully I didn't come across as uh, too, too, too air explaining or, or uh, dismissive on any of my answers. Um, I hope everything came across as I intended it as being helpful, useful, and to stimulate further thought. A lot of the times when you ask a question, it exposes to me where the misunderstanding is. And I don't ask, answer the question directly, but I challenge the question. And I think that is hopefully to stimulate critical thinking, not to be dismissive or rude. And I hopefully it was taken that way. So everyone have a great rest of your day. See you next time. This won't be my last one. And uh, thank you for following the 3DMJ YouTube channel. Take care.